I'm here with Tiago from Coalition. So thanks everyone for taking an hour with us on Friday to talk about all kinds of things behind the scenes of a data breach. So Tiago, thanks for being here to kick us off. Why don't you tell us a little bit about you know, your background, how you became part of Coalition and your story that got you to where you are today? Sure. Uh, first of all, Nick, thank you for having me. I'm really excited about being here today and talking a little bit about Coalition, all the things that we're doing, and of course, talking about what happens uh, when a company is breached. Uh, so about me, my name is Tiago Henrique. I'm originally Portuguese. I split my time between Portugal and Switzerland. I founded a company called Binary Edge seven years ago um, that essentially scans, scans the entire internet and looks for things that are exposed to the internet that shouldn't be. Um, two years ago, uh, we were acquired by Coalition, and I'm now the Director of Engineering for Security at Coalition. Um, I have three big responsibilities at Coalition. Number one, large-scale data collection, and when the underwriting platform tells us, hey, blood.com is asking us for a quote, me and my team have three minutes to find absolutely everything we can about blood.com and tell the uh, insurance platform, hey, blood.com is risky or blood.com is not risky, and here's why. Second responsibility is what we call customer-facing platforms. So if you become a coalition policyholder, you get all of your assets, uh, so things you uh, IP addresses, domains that you use that are exposed to the internet scanned. And when we find something that's vulnerable, we give you a notification of that. And that's done via a, a digital platform called Coalition Control. Um, and the third responsibility I have are the security analysts. So typically when the there are mid-market or bigger companies, we don't want to just like have a machine underwrite that company. And we actually send it to a human to do a security review and give us a better idea of the state of that company. And security analysts are also under my responsibility at Coalition. A lot of stuff. So let's let's break some of this down. So Coalition does a lot, right? And, and they're a partner of ours. And, and a lot of it's kind of data-driven cyber insurance underwriting and looking at some things. So why don't we, uh, before we start going down that path and talking behind the scenes of a breach, what is, you know, for the audience that kind of knows what cyber insurance or might know what it is, why don't we start there? What is cyber insurance? Why do we need it? Why is it important? So um, let, let, let's go back a little, right? So Coalition um, sells cyber insurance. Um, in reality, is actually called cyber liability, internet liability, electronic media liability, and network security and information liability insurance. Uh, but we typically just shorten it to cyber insurance. But think of cyber insurance as something that you buy that in case your security controls fail you, is there to save your company, essentially. There are lots of different things that are covered. Uh, from business interruption to uh, in case of a ransomware event, you need to pay forensics, you need to help pay the ransom if you as a customer choose to do so. But there are other things that typically don't know are covered by cyber insurance. So for example, let's say that you have bodily injury from a cyber attack on a SCADA, a critical system um, that actually gets covered by your cyber insurance as well. Um, so there are lots of different coverages and it changes from carrier to carrier and different policies on what cyber insurance covers. Um, so the, oh, yeah, go ahead. No, I was saying the, the best example I've ever heard on this for, for those that are kind of new to cyber insurance and, and what its purpose is, is, you know, we all have cars, uh, or at least some of us do at this point, um, because we're working remote and with our cars comes buying insurance for our car and something in case something crazy happens and we crash it, uh, we don't get in our cars and crash them every single day. We basically use our car insurance sparingly, if not ever, hoping that we don't get into a major accident. And we put all of our maintenance work and preventative work inside of our cars, like rotating our tires and making sure our tires aren't bald and putting brakes on and putting fuel in it and all those good things as good practices to make sure we don't have a major event. Um, I kind of always translated that pretty well with cyber insurance, that we don't just use cyber insurance as our daily defense shield mechanism. It's a horrible what if type mechanism. A hundred percent. And and even for us as cyber insurers, um, we never, ever advise for that. Secure, uh, insurance is not a replacement for your security controls. And in reality, we take a list of your security controls when you're filing for insurance. And if we see you have poor security controls, we might choose to not sell you a policy even. So it's 100, you're 100% correct. It is not a replacement for security controls. 
So, all right, so we talk cyber insurance, we know what it's there for, right? It's a big backdrop. So uh, inevitably things happen, right? Uh, breaches happen, and that's what we're here today to learn a little bit more about kind of what goes on behind the scenes of a breach. So can you kind of talk us through when a breach happens, um, kind of what's your guys' involvement? What happens at the companies? What's kind of the lay of the land for us all? Sure. So uh, if we start right at the beginning, uh, we need to think about where did we learn about the breach? So Coalition scans the entire internet and the dark web. And that means sometimes we know that one of our policyholders is infected even before they know, because we get access to hackers communicating to each other and selling access or to machines that are infected and they're communicating outside with uh, sensors or honeypots. So it depends on where the breach starts. If it starts internally in us discovering a policyholder is infected, it's going to start with us involving our claims team, um, with us involving our incident response team, because we have our own internally as well, and reaching out to the policyholder, immediately trying to get them on the phone, explain to them what we're seeing, what we're observing, and how the next steps are going to go. And the next steps typically are create a separate email inbox so where we can contact them without the attackers knowing in case it's a compromised inbox, for example, or our incident response team uh, deploying EDR and being able to monitor the network of our policyholders remotely, looking for, hey, how did this infection happen? Um, and then we go into incident response mode, right? Trying to understand what caused this? Was this something we didn't see, like an RDP that was on a server somewhere? Or did someone click on something on an email? Did someone download something? Did someone visit a suspicious website that compromised the machine? So we have an entire incident response process to try and understand root cause. Um, the interesting thing about root cause is for us, um, it essentially is one of the most important things because at Coalition, it's like we have a flywheel. Anything that our incident response team learns, like, hey, this policyholder got compromised by a zero day, so a vulnerability that doesn't have a patch. We can use that knowledge to only get beat once because we can notify other policyholders that have that same technology immediately after we learn about these things from our incident response team. So we go from essentially notifying the customers or being notified by the customer if the customer found out about the incident, then activating our claims team, activating our incident response team to help them, gathering all the facts, starting to help with uh, restoration, and at the same time, learning the root cause analysis, um, and then feeding all of those learnings into our underwriting as well. So that's pretty, pretty cool. So you guys are, uh, how often does that happen where you're finding stuff before the company even finds it themselves? Uh, quite often. Um, so we, um, just yesterday, for example, uh, we, we got uh, access to a, a new data set of infected companies and we notified seven policyholders. Um, it was email compromises, I believe, that their inboxes had been compromised. And that's just from yesterday. And it doesn't necessarily need to be that they had some bad behavior. It's just sometimes, you know, someone clicks on something or you get an email and you visit a website that leads to bad stuff. But uh, it, uh, we... We send a lot of notifications and work with lots of different policyholders to help them fix things. Um, we're starting to see a lot of progress in the front of ransomware and things that are exposed to the internet because we already have a really good automated mechanism. Hey, we scan you every month. We're seeing this stuff open. We notify you. You fix it. You tell us that you fixed it. We scan you again and we confirm it. And now it's more about the proactive things. So detecting infections and notifying the policyholders. One of the bigger struggles and what typically actually takes us more time is finding the right language to communicate, right? Because it's a lot of technical data. It's a lot of really complex topics. So imagine trying to explain to uh, a two-person florist shop in Texas, hey, you have to shut down your uh, QuickBooks RDP server. And the lady going, I don't know what RDP is. I know that I double click an icon on my desktop and I get to access my QuickBooks server. So um, trying to explain all of this to them and how to fix them is actually like where the harder part of the work is. I could imagine some people you call and they're like, who the heck are you? <laughs> like, yeah. Right. I mean, it could be scary. Like, is that, are you the good guys, bad guys, or how do I supposed to know kind of stuff? 
A hundred percent. And, and uh, one of the problems we also have in insurance, of course, is sometimes we don't have direct contact with the end user, depending if the policy was bought through wholesale or a retailer, it can take different paths. So finding the right person to talk to and finding the right language to communicate to uh, is critical. It's one of the most interesting parts of my job is working with our marketing team because we have found that the folks on our marketing team help us so, so much on getting the right language to a level that everyone can understand what we're trying to tell them. So it's not just security work that we do, it's collaborating with marketing team and getting the right wording to explain security issues. Well, it's fun. so, you know, a lot of the theme of this month is all about kind of educating the masses and, and figuring out how do we get each other to work together and build a community around security. So it sounds like, you know, you guys are kind of putting together a little community of not only your customers, but learning from what else is happening in the security community and trying to disseminate that information as quickly as you can. Um, what are some patterns, I guess, that you're seeing, I guess, or commonalities amongst those that are getting those phone calls and those that are not. And, you know, you, you talked a little bit about root causes. Is there something that we should all be well aware of today if we're not already? So there are a couple of, of commonalities. Um, I would say the number one is customers not knowing their attack surface. So a customer thinks, hey, I have these five IP addresses, but in reality, he has 10. Or he thinks, say, hey, there's this domain that I have, and then the year later, he registers a second domain and loses track of the first one. And we see this with a lot of companies. It's the reason why we created what's called coalition control. So um, in control.coalitioninc.com, we have a platform that is free for every organization, independent if you're a policyholder or not, where you get free attack surface monitoring from Coalition for free, no strings attached, because we found that it was the biggest issue that um, and most common issue that organizations had. They didn't know what they even are supposed to be protecting. So it's uh, we decided as part of our White House commitment, just give it away for everyone. Uh, and... Uh, it's going to be, uh, as a note to our participants, keep an eye out on control. There's going to be something pretty interesting coming down the road between us and curricula. Uh, I don't want to spoil, but I suggest that you register for control and keep an eye out on the curricula tab as well. Yeah, but that so, would be my common thing. The most common thing is definitely like people not, organizations not knowing their attack surface, which IP addresses they own, which um, domains they own. And one interesting thing as well, not knowing their third-party chains. So we saw this a lot, for example, with Kaseya. Um, there was a um, remote management tool called Kaseya that was um, compromised by hackers and hackers then got access to the Kaseya software, which is used by MSPs and third-party companies that assist with IT. And then the customers of those companies got hacked as well. So even if the companies themselves had secure infrastructure, the people that provides in IT support to them didn't. Um, and uh, some companies started getting hacked via their third-party providers. That entire event actually led us to reshape how we do underwriting. We used to look at just a company that was asking for a policy. And we've now moved on where we look at the entire ecosystem around that company. We try to understand which vendors do they use and are those vendors secure? Which technologies do the vendors use? And are those technologies secure to the remote management? We reshaped a lot of our underwriting to take into account third party as well. They, uh, I just did a talk yesterday for one of our uh, well-known customer in the industry, uh, one of our customers about that exact scenario, right? It's the fact that we're not just practicing and going through this stuff for ourselves. We have to have kind of this circle of trust that we're building amongst our employees, our contractors, our vendors, and everyone that we interact with, because at some point, it's inevitable that something's going to go wrong. It, it's almost uncontrollable at this point. So... Given that situation, uh, something that we're big advocates for is practice makes perfect, right? You can't get better at anything if you don't practice. And yep. for, for you guys, you know, uh, what's kind of your recommendation on uh, incident response, tabletop type exercises and simulation type stuff? So there are a couple of things. Um, one, we're, we're actually working on a lot of materials and, and, and training specifically around instant response that we're going to make available for companies so they can start to understand 
how to even look at an incident, right? Um, from, hey, if uh, this machine got compromised and we lost all of the data that's in there, do we have it backed up? Where do we have it backed up? Are we testing those backups? So uh, essentially, we're, we're looking at building a cyber maturity model that guides people through, hey, here's where we are. Here's where typically companies with our revenue, with our employee size in our industry, where they typically should be. And we want to build the road for them to get there. And that involves us building training, that involves us giving them easy ways to run tabletop exercises. So for example, because we know, hey, this is your database server from our scans, us being able to generate dynamic tabletop exercises where we just send like a PDF to the customer that says, hey, let's imagine that this server got encrypted with ransomware. Do you know where that data would be located? So we're doing a lot of work around that area. And of course, look forward to collaborating more with QIK on educating and training people as well. And for those that don't, uh, haven't been through tabletop exercise or just hearing this for the first time, it's kind of just a, a paper documentation. You're kind of walking through certain events and you're kind of talking about it. And I've, I've been part of plenty of these uh, nation events that have been put on, uh, small events, and I've seen them take place firsthand. And it's it's kind of fun to watch, I guess, sometimes because one time we talked through one with, uh, you know, hey, if someone got hacked right now and the uh, the news started spreading and reporters started calling your organization, who's allowed to talk to them? And then the lawyers literally okay. started arguing with each other in the room, like, no, that's Michael's job or Susie's job or who cares and this and that. Like, you guys are the executive management and you have no idea who's supposed to respond. What do you think your employees are doing out there? And that's what the purpose of these tabletop exercises is to kind of get your, your, uh, your processes together, your communication plans together. And it's not all technical. Um, the other thing that, you know, we highly recommend is simulations, right? One of the things that, uh, you know, when I'm sure you see so many breaches, right? How many times are these events that uh, someone putting a claim in are their first time they've ever gone through this? Is that, is that pretty frequent? It, it is not. It's definitely something that companies need to improve on. And, and it's, it's interesting because you can kind of tell from the initial call when companies have been through this stuff before. If you're getting an initial call from a policyholder and you just get a really panicky voice on the other hand, you know that it's like it's their first rodeo on this. And there's a, a strong psychological component about calming the person down and trying to get the information that you need out of them to even understand what's happening versus where sometimes, you know, you pick up the phone and they're like, yeah, we we're seeing encrypted files on our server. And you just know, that even just by that initial phone call, you know, the level of maturity of the company as well. Hmm. So that's uh, that's interesting. If you had to take a guess on those first uh, first rodeo people versus people that have been through it, what would you what would you say there? I, I would say there's a lot larger percentage on first rodeo, like first much rodeo. much larger. We really need to get companies to start thinking about the tabletop exercises and practicing with their staff how to go through one of these crises. One hundred percent. It's not something companies are prepared for right now. And it's stressful. If, if anyone's ever been part of that, like if you do a good one, you feel a little stressed out because even though it's fake, you're kind of reacting as if you really would. And it's, it's really good to go through this. Like Tiago said, is that don't let this be your first rodeo. If you're listening to this and you're trying to take something away from today, think about this. Think about practicing some exercises, even from a process point of view, uh, all the way to a curricula point of view where you can actually simulate real attacks and see the results and see how you respond to those attacks and who would or wouldn't respond, it's pretty eye-opening. So, so with that, you know, talking through some exercises and how that's really important for, you know, for a lot of us out there and a lot of the, the policyholders that you take care of are small businesses, right? Small businesses mm -hmm. that are growing. I don't think I've ever heard a business say, we have a fully staffed IT and security team and we have too many. I, I don't think that's a common phrase. I think it's always, we're understaffed, overworked. So for those that are listening in, what are some best practices that a, uh, a team of one or a team of somewhat none can follow to uh, do something today? And don't forget to add that we don't have budget. Uh, so it's it's very, very hard to get budget for security, right? Because it, it's also very, very hard 
for a CISO or head of security to sell the return on investment that you get for security because it's transparent. It's like, I don't really need it until you need it. That's at least what goes on the mind of people. So my suggestions would be the following. Uh, 100% uh, sign up for coalition control. Like the control.coalitioninc.com, you get a tax surface monitoring for free that if you go to a third party, you typically have to pay twenty to $30,000 per year just to get access to what we give you there for free. Um, at least that way, you have a vision into what you're protecting. Um, number two would be um, you need to follow the the right uh, set of news from someplace, right? Um, either Twitter or following on the news specific people or websites for security, just so that you're aware of what's coming out. So if we in control are telling you, hey, these are your IP addresses and these are your technologies, and we inform you of some vulnerabilities, you also want to make sure you're keeping uh, an eye on news on, you know, if anything that affects you. The other part as well, that would be my suggestion is get cyber insurance. Because if you don't, have, cyber insurance policies are not very expensive and they typically come packaged with lots of different benefits, So, right? So if we look, for example, for us at Coalition, just if you sign up as a policyholder, you get the attack surface monitoring for yourself plus five vendors and you get access to all of our technology partners like curricula and a bunch of others where you get discounts, where if you're working on a constraint budget, just by buying the policy, you get access to a bunch of other stuff that you don't have to pay extra for. Um, and of course, even if it all fails, you still have the policy to help you. Um, the other part as well, of course, is, is training. Um, train your people, train them on how to deal with emails, train them how to deal with visiting websites, install free add-ons and deploy free add-ons that help you block things in the browser, like Ghostery, for example. That will block a lot of attacks that typically happen when you visit um, bad websites or when you know, you're trying to load, your browser is trying to load things that they shouldn't. Um, those would be my, my top recommendations, of course. Yeah, it's um, you know, it's all back to that theme of building a community around this. And then the the goal, you know, with all of this is that I remember speaking with Joshua, the coalition CEO, several times about this, is that you don't really eliminate any of this risk. You just kind of transfer it to someone. And by not having some type of insurance, you're basically accepting that risk yourself that you were gonna have to pay that out. Or and if you can't pay it out, what are you gonna do? So Think of it that way when you're thinking about this in general, what cyber insurance means. It, it means that you're, you're getting some assistance in the community to transfer some of that risk to someone else. And hopefully you never have to use it. That's the goal, right? With car insurance, with any type of insurance, but it's more about these other processes, tools, and things that you just can't do on your own and you need help. So if we can stress anything there, it's that build your community. Build your community of knowledge, your community of tools, your community of assets to get better at this. Um, and I was just okay. going to mention that when you're building your community, and if you do go down the road of buying cyber insurance, of course, I'm a chill for coalition because I work for coalition, but make sure you take a look at your carrier. You want a carrier that isn't just selling you insurance. You want a carrier that's going to be your partner in that community. That's with you when you're buying the insurance policy, that's with you when you're monitoring your assets, that's with you if you need to do a phone call and you're sitting down at this tabletop exercise and you're saying, oh my God, I don't know what to do about this specific exercise. We provide that for free. You can call Coalition and ask to talk to a security analyst and we'll provide time from our security analysts to get you, to help you put your correct processes in place. But again, Make sure you're picking the right carrier to be your partner in your community. So what are some fun facts about cyber insurance that people don't really know? I know we're talking about this and there's, you know, it's, it sounds um, overwhelming, right? There's a lot of things that you got to do and there's always people trying to get you, but what are some fun things that we should know about cyber insurance? 
There, there are a couple. So, for example, there are certain things that are covered um, that sometimes people don't know. A perfect example of this is if you have a laptop in your car and, you know, car gets broken into, laptop gets stolen, we actually have a computer replacement uh, coverage on our policies. So even something that's not necessarily in the digital world, that it's like in the physical world, would be covered by that as well. Um, a couple of other things that we've seen as, as fun facts. Well, uh, more interesting facts than fun facts. Uh, a question we get asked often is, do you guys actually pay for claims? Um, because And the question comes from one specific case. So Mondelez uh, filed for a, a claim um, with Zurich Insurance and Zurich refused to pay. And the reason for that is Mondelez actually didn't have cyber insurance. They were trying to use their property insurance to cover something that would have been covered by cyber insurance. So Zurich was right to reject their claim. And a lot of people don't know this and just assume that cyber insurers are just like any other insurer and trying to get away from paying claims. We don't. Um, and the last piece as well is um, we uh, a question we get asked often um, is about, is cyber insurance helping with ransomware? Um, it's been a discussion we've had time and time again, and we don't believe so. Uh, we, as insurers, always try to drive our customer to restoration, to trying to get their best practices. We're, we, as insurers, are in a place that for the first time in the cybersecurity industry, we can ask customers to enforce these best practices. We can ask them to follow a set of guidelines to be more secure. There's never been anyone in the cybersecurity industry that has this stick and carrot situation, right? So no, we, we, we don't want to help with ransomware. We don't want our customers to pay for ransomware. We want our customers to be secure and to follow the best practices. It, um, you know, we spent a lot of time with our customers kind of looking at the maturity model, right? From doing absolutely no education to being forced to do education through some type of compliance or contract of some sort to actually getting really good at education inside of your organization. Uh, given that model that kind of we follow, who do you think, you know, from those that you've seen or interacted with, do you see a similar stage or progression of no insurance to somewhat understanding insurance to like really understanding insurance and then who's at risk for falling victim to this um so we we see that the customers we we onboard um ramp up much faster than other companies we've observed right so they go from not really caring about insurance and oftentimes they're buying insurance just as a coverage for not doing anything in security but we make it interesting for them, right? Like from starting to be able to, hey, if you buy these defensive technologies or you follow our guidelines, your premium next year is going to be better than this year. Oh, and by the way, here's a new technology package from one of our partners that you used to pay, have to pay for, but now it's free. Let's go train some of your people. Um, so we, we see that customers that end up buying cyber insurance, independent of the reason that they initially bought it, um, they ramp up much, much faster uh, on their security maturity model, essentially on, on, on cybersecurity maturity model. Um, and we're hoping to continue on that trend. Uh, but for us as coalition, it's gonna be just like, as you mentioned, uh, our policyholders and companies need to build their own community. It's what we're doing at the coalition as well. We're building a coalition of companies and partners that want to fight cybercrime, that want to help make these companies more secure. And that's the road that we're on. That's awesome. So, you know, when someone comes into the control dashboard that you talked about before, you have three minutes to kind of look around and try to find everything you can about that company. What else goes into the kind of the, the for everyone's knowledge, kind of like the underwriting process, at least that you can share as part of this whole data collection thing? Sure. So we look at a bunch of different things. Um, we, of course, try to find every subdomain and IP address that the company uses. We look at the dark web. Has this company been mentioned in the dark web by hackers for any reason, because they're selling credentials or because they're mentioning that they want to hire someone to potentially attack the company? We look at third-party data hacks. So let's say that you, Nick, register with your curricular account for a Dropbox uh, account and Dropbox gets hacked and their database leaks. We, can, we are on the dark web collecting all those data leaks and we can see, hey, Nick, 
some of your credentials are potentially out there because you registered for Dropbox and they got hacked. Uh, so we take all of these data points and then we also look at things like, um, okay, does this company have all their assets sitting in the same region of AWS or all in the same provider? Because that leads us to calculating how we're going to deal with business interruption, right? If AWS comes down or if a region in AWS comes down, does the company is the company able to work? Yes or no? And then there's a piece that doesn't come from scans, that comes essentially from the broker, the broker asking the policyholder, hey, what's your backup strategy? Do you have EDR? In how many machines do you have EDR? Do you do security training? Who's your security training um, provider? Um, because essentially from our side, we also do product evaluation. We also have our own security team trying to break different products and understanding if I'm a hacker, how hard is it for me to compromise a company if they use this product? So we start to have internally a matrix of how good an EDR is, how, what's the best VPN solution, all of, uh, same thing for backups as well. Um, and we use all of these data points, a combination of human expert knowledge, things we get from scanning, things we get from this insurance questionnaire to calculate how risky a company is and how much we should charge for a policy. So it's a lot of stuff, right? This yeah. is more than just a piece of paper with three questions on it. And I think like the hysterical reality is that's true. That's happening today, that there are insurance companies out there literally writing policies, asking three questions or potentially no questions and giving away policies. Like that's not good. It's not smart, right? It just doesn't seem like where we're, we're heading. So the, the, the more data we can learn and know about each other, the more we can work together to protect it and ultimately have a better community around this. Um, so and it's more that, than just selling it's more than just selling policies. I just want to make a note here as well. We we had um, the CEO of one of the incumbents on on stage, I believe it was two days ago, that where he made it seem that only the data and analytics part is all that matter from the technology piece, but it's not. We think about it in different ways. So, for example, when we're looking at a company for the first time, we make a binary decision. Uh, well, not binary, three-way decision. Do we want to sell a policy? Yes or no. And if yes, with some contingencies or not, right? But then the moment you become a policyholder, it continues. It's a continuous work in progress. Are you get into our um, active risk reduction process. We're going to scan you every month. We're going to tell you the things you need to fix. We're going to tell you are you evolving in the cybersecurity maturity model. We're going to work with you so that one year from now, when renewal time comes along, it's a much smoother process where you're in a much better place. Um, when when pre-acquisition, when we were at Binary Edge, one of the biggest struggles we had was convincing companies to do things. We would find companies with RDP open and we would email them for free, give them the data for free, ask for nothing as a small startup, really scrappy startup, and companies wouldn't act. I've managed to get more companies to shut down their RDP in the last month at Collision than I did in four years at Binary Edge. That's the power of insurance. We can get companies to a certain baseline of security and get them to evolve from there. And I think, you know, recognizing that theme, right? I think this is something that we've all started to recognize, embrace, and I don't think there's a looking back on this. Uh, so for the global insurance market, if you're listening or not listening or a participant or not right now, uh, things are changing for the better, right? I think a lot of this is for the better. Uh, what type of requirements do you see currently as part of that, like, we're not writing a policy unless you do this kind of stuff. And what do you think is happening in the future globally that all cyber insurance and cyber liability insurance providers will start doing? Uh, the basic, well, the basics right now for us would be things like having a good DDR, having a good backup strategy, providing training uh, to your employees, not have remote management services exposed directly to the internet. So things like RDP, Kaseya, ConnectWise. If you have machines that um, you connect to, to then remote manage other machines and they are just exposed to the internet and not sitting behind the VPN, that's a big no-no for us. Um, and one of the things we do at Coalition that's really interesting as well is even to decide um, what we want to, to set as our baseline, we look at what attackers are doing. Perfect example of this, you have a vulnerability that came out two days ago for Apache, where if you have an Apache server, uh, 1549 or something like that version, um, it, it, 
is essentially attacker, an attacker can compromise it pretty easily. And we on our team already set up a bunch of honeypots, so vulnerable machines, and we're seeing how attackers behave um, towards that vulnerability. And we're essentially going to use that data to understand how it fits in our underwriting system. Do we tell companies now that if they have Apache because of this condition, we don't want to write them anymore? Or do you want to bump their premium? So there's a set of basics that essentially involves, here's a, a, a list of security controls you need to have, EDR, backups, training. And then there's the list of, hey, these technologies are bad. And this is a list that dynamically changes uh, month over month. We, it's continuously e evolving. Uh, and that's the interesting thing, right? Security is not static at all. It's, it evolves very, very fast. So uh, it evolves in two ways for us. On the underwriting system, do we want to write this company or not because of these technologies? And internally, if the company already has a policy, we need to be notifying them of these vulnerabilities as well. And that's the, the direction that it's going. It's all about figuring out two parts. One, does this company have vulnerabilities that are going to lead to a claim? Yes or no. And then after you brought them in, how do you make them secure? So you have to build tools for them. You have to build the right communication for them. And you need to be prepared to deal with all sorts of customers from SME customers that have no IT teams at all to mid-market customers that are much better prepared and where the communication is much easier because they've got like 20 people in IT security or IT in general. Um, so that's where carriers need to go. They need to learn how to collect the data, leverage the data across the entire underwriting process, including after writing the policy and um, essentially making their policyholders better because they have that capability. So the more data, you know, like you said, there's not a perfect answer because it's kind of always evolving. As the vulnerabilities get exposed, we're starting to find them, help the community fix them. And those that don't are at high risk, right? This yep. is just the way of life and the way that we kind of act and do everything in our, in our lives is that we're, we're trying to get better as a bigger community. And what all we're saying here is that we're breaking down that community into uh, smaller chunks with a focused risk, cyber stuff, and trying to help protect you against it. And if you don't want to protect yourself against it, then you're higher risk. It's, exactly. it's just a fact, right? We have enough data to start saying some of this stuff. Um, I kind of translate that to, you know, if you look at some of the other industries and, and insurance spaces that are more mature with a lot more data, look at kind of home ownership, right? Flood insurance, there's a reason that if you buy a house that's right next to the beach, it's going to be expensive because they know it's going to get flooded. <laughs> like pretty yeah. good chance some point that thing's going to get flooded and they have to pay out a bunch of money for it. So they raise your premium for that. Uh, same thing with our, our cars and our, our homes. I mean, recently we bought a home and they ask you, do you have a bunch of things like smoke detectors, locks on your door, alarm cameras, and uh, like fire system, fire alarm system? It's like, yeah, you do. It's like, cool. If you say you have it, prove it. And then you have to literally show a live connection to Ring or whatever the tools that you're using. And if you don't, you don't get the discount and they don't uh, deem that you're less risky because you're more risky, you don't have it. And uh, so with all of that, I think we're just doing the same model in the insurance, in the cyber side of insurance, but the data and the, the maturity, I think of the organizations that are providing this, they're not doing what coalition's doing, right? We're still using papers and asking questions saying, hey, are you good at not getting hacked? as a company. And if you just say, yeah, I'm pretty good at that. It's like, what is that doing for anyone? <laughs> yeah. And, and even, even worse than that, you have organizations that are buying the data and then don't know how to leverage it. Like that's the interesting piece. Like any, anyone can throw, you know, uh, sign, sign up for a binary edge account or a Shodan account or throw an end map and start end mapping a company, like doing a part scan. But how do you understand those results? And specifically in insurance, how do you translate those results into something that has a dollar amount or a risk level amount? The, the, our competitors and, and other carriers, that's the part that they're not prepared for. Most of them aren't even getting the data. The ones that are don't know how to leverage it correctly. Um, and by the way, we're not perfect either. It's a, it's a learning experience for us. It's not like we're, at, we're sitting at 0% claims, right? But what we do is anytime we, we get bit, we learn, we send our IR team, we learn where we failed, we improve. And year over year, we're seeing that improvement in our claim rate. Yeah, it's, uh, 
lessons learned is one of the, the most advocated thing that I think a lot of people don't want to spend time and attention to because, you know, everyone's kind of heads down and just keep going in any business. And I think everyone can take a, a second to pause here and, and listen to that. The insurance providers are doing lessons learned because they're in the business of lessons learned. They have to be because if they just let hackers run a rampage and don't figure out ways to reduce risk, well, there's not enough money to go around to pay out all the hackers. So we got to make sure that we're all working towards a better answer to make the hackers sad, right? I've talked about this yep. time and time again, if you ever hear me talk at conferences that we want to make hackers sad. We want to make their lives miserable because they shouldn't be doing what they're doing. We're letting them do what they're doing and we should put a stop to it together. A hundred percent. And so the, what ba about the basics, just got one note, the basics will always help you. Like the, those backups like having the backups segregating having offline backups the actual basics the foundation will always be helpful always and they're not hard to get right so yeah so so we spend a lot of time talking about you know if anyone's ever heard compliance isn't security kind of uh discussion so there are a lot of people that I'm sure you see, we work with all the time that are just compliance driven, right? Compliance forced them to go do an insurance policy or their insurance company tells them to come to us because I got to go do phishing. They just requiring it. It's like, okay, you could check the box easily with a lot of different ways just to say you're doing something. But um, it's one thing to say you're doing something. It's another thing to be effective. And it's another thing to lie, right? Have, have you ever run across that variety or the trifecta here of those different experiences we we have we have so there's two interesting situations here one and the most common that we run into and it's not people don't lie on purpose is backups where we've seen many carriers ask the question do you do backups and person answers yes tiny problem they don't test the backups and when they get infected with ransomware they're going to try and restore oops the backups were corrupted or we can't restore from them and the carrier still has to pay. That's, I think, the most typical version we've seen. The other funny situations we caught once where we we did see a, someone trying to lie to us was we, we monitor for companies when they get hacked. There are multiple ways that we do this. And we can see with high precision when it happens. So we're talking to the minute in some cases. And we had a company that signed up for a policy and immediately filed for a claim the day after. And of course, we looking at our at our stuff, you know, we knew that they had been compromised. We saw how it was happening. And they were essentially trying to commit insurance fraud because we knew they were compromised. We knew that, you know, it was never going to happen. And when we were trying to explain to them why they were being declined, they're like, no, we have no event going on. No, we have no event going on. They did have an event going on and we knew about it. And they knew about it because the ransomware had been triggered as well. Uh, so, but it's rare that these cases happen. They do happen every now and then. But my suggestion would be, if you're working with a modern cyber insurance carrier, tell them the truth, tell them your current state, because they have the right tools, they have the right people to come and help you evolve, to come and help you be better and have a better cybersecurity hygiene. Don't try to lie on your cyber insurance application because it's not going to help you. The other situation, by the way, we catch a lot as well. And again, not on purpose. We'll see brokers and customers give us a domain like abc.com and not give us anything else. And typically that company has like a hundred more domains that they actually use and have registered. So of course this, this gets caught by our enumeration process because part of the enumeration process is, hey, let's go out there and see if we can detect if this company has alternative domains and we catch like 10, 20, 30, something extra domains associated with the company. So we always have to go back and tell them, hey, by any chance, are these domains also yours? And they're like, oh yeah, I forgot. Or this was a vanity domain I registered, blah, 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 blah. So we get a couple of different interesting situations. That's funny. Like you said, like sometimes it's just, it's keeping the honest people honest, right? It's sometimes you just don't know and, and you make mistakes, but it's uh, do not intentionally go out of your way to try to lie to your insurance carrier or anyone that you're trusting to work with because the short-term game will never be worth the long-term consequences. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so what else do people file claims for? I know we can't kind of predict the future of, you know, anything and everything coming our way, but what, you know, you guys put out these claims reports. I hear people talking about it all the time and there's lots of data in there. So if you haven't 
uh, seen that claims report for for Q2, I think it was, of, of this year that yeah. you definitely should. Uh, what else data has come out of that or what you guys are kind of trending towards? So we, we see a reduction in, in ransomware. Um, we're still seeing a rising trend, I believe, in FTF and BC. Uh, so funds transfer fraud and uh, business email compromise. Uh, so an inbox being compromised or, for example, a hacker compromises one of your third-party vendors and sends you an invoice pretending to be them and you pay it. You think you're paying to your vendor. You're actually paying to the hackers. So we see quite a lot of those. In regards to the future, um, I'm excited to see when we're going to start uh, covering crypto and see our first NFT got stolen claim. Uh, mm. You know, you've got this huge trend now with NFTs and people owning assets on the blockchain. Uh, and you see a lot of like smart contracts with vulnerabilities as well. That's, it's going to be interesting to see how cyber insurance lead, uh, deals with that in the future, right? Uh, essentially like digital assets being stolen. Years ago, I remember doing a presentation and I had this thing like, you know, lining up all these different books and cyber was part of that book that we get introduced to it as a young age. And, you know, with online currencies and all the crazy stuff that's going on right now, like, I don't know, my Bitcoin wallet got stolen. Who do I go to for help? And is there insurance? I mean, is that something you guys are thinking of too? Like Bitcoin wallet insurance stuff? We are looking at a bunch of stuff involving digital currencies. It's 100% a hot topic for us. And we're, we're working on a couple of interesting things there. All right. Well, protect your Bitcoin wallets because uh, there's a <laughs> lot of criminals out there trying to steal. So, you know, if we're getting hit so hard, right, you can't turn on the, the news every day or, or you know, uh, look at the, you know, the Internet and just find articles about this. Businesses are getting rampaged by hackers left and right of all shapes and sizes. What do we do to fight back? Is there a way to fight back? Should we fight back? What's kind of your advice for everyone there? Um, so everyone, everyone plays a part, right? Uh, for, for companies, he's 100% trying to follow the best practices as much as possible. That way you stop ransoms from happening. You stop hackers from receiving money. You stop giving them access to your machines that are then used to attack other machines. So if companies just try to follow the basics of cybersecurity where they're not being used and exploited by hackers, that would be, of course, a huge help. Then... Training, 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 um, you know, making sure that your employees are given the time. Don't make it an out of works thing where you just, you know, sign them up for a curricular account or for some training account and tell them, hey, here's the login and password. Uh, when you're at home, go check it out every now and then. No, give them time during working hours for them to learn cybersecurity, learn how to behave in a digital world, um, learn about what a bad email looks like, learn about the things they need to be suspicious of. It might not feel like it, but the return on investment on that, that you're going to get for you and your company, it's going to be a big, big one. You do not want to go through a breach. You do not want to go through the process of having to notify your customers that all their data got stolen because you didn't follow basic cybersecurity be behavior, essential. You don't want to go through the media, the press, the pressure of all of that. So make sure your people are getting educated. Make sure you're thinking to the tabletop exercises. Make sure you're doing the basics. And again, build your community, find your partners that can help you grow. Yeah. So, you know, given that, I mean, uh, it's probably in the report and I kind of remember reading it somewhere, but average costs that we're talking about playing that cleanup game, is it 20 grand, 30 grand, or are we talking a lot Ooh, more? Now you're putting me on the spot. So I, I don't I remember am, either. I, 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 I read the report a long, long time ago. I cannot report, remember Hundreds? what's the average cost. I, I think it was remember. a few hundred grand. It was something like a few hundred grand is the average. And then the average ransomware demand was like something over a million bucks now or something it's, like that. So it's, it's very high values. And they actually grew a lot from last year to this year. So if anyone from Coalition is on the chat and can give me a help here, can we get the average uh, cost of a ransomware claim uh, and how much it grew from last year to this year? I'm sure someone well, even, will write on the chat. So. Even better. Go download the report right now. Or go download the report. You get to look at the data yourself. So I know we're kind of wrapping up here. We want to get to some Q&A, but you know, for our final thoughts, I know uh, Josh Ramada, CEO of Coalition, was recently invited to the White House to talk about how do we make this better for everyone? How do we make cybersecurity part of everyone's lives and what are we going to do to help? And you talked a little bit about 
coalition control being part of that, um, what's next? You know, what's, what else can we do for everyone to help fight the good fight? And how do we get this community to get more involved? What's your kind of closing thoughts? Um, so there are, there are a couple of, of parts to this. One, we need much better coll collaboration between big tech as well, right? So often we'll detect infected domains or uh, companies that are compromised and we try to contact the registrar, try to get them to shut down a domain that belongs to the malware and communication can take months sometimes. So it's like having a better way to communicate between the different tech companies because all of us see different signals, right? Like if you're Microsoft, you're sitting on all the Windows Telemetry, three, you can see a lot of infected things, but are they sharing that data outside? Even if in an anonymized matter, like they have a lot of information that would be useful for other companies that are also used to dealing with big data insecurity that have great analysts that have different techniques from them to be able to collaborate on that data. So having big tech um, collaborate more, talking more, um, and having more expedient ways of communicating takedowns would be a really great way. And of course, for companies, um, just start to take security seriously, you know, and not like after you get breached, write the email to your customers, we take security seriously. That's not taking it seriously. If you're writing that email, you didn't take it seriously. So start really understanding what is the basics. You don't need to do everything. That's that's the, a problem we have in security. We can sometimes tell people lots of different things and it can feel overwhelming. You don't need to do everything. Start with the basics. Start to understand what's your infrastructure looking like. Start to understand what your partner's infrastructure is looking like. How... Um, for example, let's say that there are a million vulnerabilities. Not all of them are the same. Which ones are the ones that are important? And focus on fixing those. We do this in coalition control. For example, when you go there, we give you vulnerabilities broken down by critical, high, medium, and low. We ask people to focus on criticals and highs, else it becomes too much. It's too overwhelming. So prioritize learning about security, prioritize on what you're fixing uh, on your security, um, and start going up and up the maturity model. It's, it's definitely a, a long, long road. Start walking it. Don't just sit on the sidelines and don't expect cyber insurance to be some magic bullet. We're there to help you. We're there when things really, really fail, but you also need to do a lot of your own homework as well. Good thoughts there. So my two cents on that is echoing everything that Tiago just said and practice makes perfect, right? We've talked about that plenty of times here is that uh, there's there's a, a method to the madness of after you go through practice, you learn behaviorally, psychologically, and everything in between on how to get better, how to do something different. Uh, professional athletes do this all the time. They practice before they go into games. Uh, airline pilots practice every single month on how to fly planes. They're professionals at it. They've been doing it for decades. Why do they still practice? Because mistakes happen and they need to be prepared. So there's no reason that you shouldn't be practicing all of this stuff that we're talking about, because if you don't, you don't want the first time experiencing a data breach to be on the phone with Tiago and his team. Uh, you do not want that. You don't want to be panicking on that phone call. You want to be structured. You want to know what to do and how to do it. So Tiago, thank you for, for sharing all that info with us today and sitting down and talking with me. And for everyone listening in, I know there's been uh, more teases coming for staying tuned in the next couple of weeks. There's going to be some big announcements between the, the two companies here. And we're just excited to be partners with Coalition. Thanks for having me, Nick. I really appreciate so, it. Absolutely. So a couple of questions we have from the audience while we wrap up here. Uh, first one here, I have a real estate investment business. I'm having all of our tenants now use a portal for paying rent. Should I get cyber insurance? You should, 100%. If you're storing data of any type, uh, you should get cyber insurance because we're going to help you understand if the way um, your portal is working, if it's secure, if you're storing your tenant's data securely. So you should 100% get cyber insurance. Go get it. Then you know okay. where to. Uh, the EDR, are you looking specifically for AI-based EDR or are you still okay with signature-based EDR? So the great thing about us being collision the way we are and we make money selling insurance, it means we can do what Gardner tries to do for money. And what I mean by that is we have, we're impartial. We don't really care 
what EDR you take. We just want you to take a good EDR. And we actually make available to all of our policyholder a list of different EDRs that our security teams have tested and our incident response teams have seen in real world uh, how they helped with incident response. And we make that list um, available to our policyholders via coalition control as well. There is a subset of EDRs and we do try to make it modern EDRs, things like um, Sentinel-1, for example, uh, CrowdStrike, um, and there are a bunch more on the list that you can check out in control. Uh, this kind of rolls right off of that. Is it possible to get a sample of tabletop events that we could try in house or some example simulations? Um, I, we are going to be making some of this stuff available. Uh, we don't have it just yet, but keep an eye on control. We do have a couple of things coming in there as well. Yeah. And on the simulation side, I mean, our approach is that you're using these to start the convo of, uh, what do we do next? Right. And we provide a, a phishing simulation tool that allows you to send a simulated attack to see who's going to fall victim. But a lot of times that's just the start of the conversation. Based off the results of there, there's lessons learned, there's uh, process changes, procedure changes, technology changes that all take place because we started with that learning moment. And you know what I would recommend is if you're if you're thinking about creating tabletop exercises, although templates are all good too, uh, just kind of think about critical things in your business, things that could go wrong, should go wrong, and make it up right? Make a fun event out of it where you could say, I want one team to be the simulators and I want one team to be the responders and get in a room, you know, have a party, pizza party, and just uh, figure it out. It could be on Zoom and stuff and just walk through it together. It's, it's eye-opening how much stuff comes out of these events in one day, then you could pretend to put compliance policies and procedures in place that are irrelevant to when you experience this in real life. Uh, should we use controlcoalition.com or binary edge? Control.coalitioninc.com. That's definitely the preferred uh, URL to sign up for. Perfect. Well, that is all we have. We're uh, a couple minutes early here. Any other last uh, thoughts, Tiago, before we jump off today? Uh, I was just going to say, if you're a policyholder, you can sign up with your policyholder account. Uh, Collision Control has become the default policyholder dashboard for all of our policyholders. Uh, if you are an organization who's not a policyholder, you can still sign up for Control. What we offer for every organization for free is really, really good. Um, my only other words today are thank you so much, Nick, for having us today. And I'm super, super excited about what's coming for us together with Curiaclia in the upcoming weeks. Same here. Thanks, Tiago, for having us. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in today with us. Cool.